Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers and discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. But we don't stop there. Every month we'll be bringing you special episodes with open science leaders where we discuss how to fix academia. Easy, right? So hit that subscribe button, leave a rating or find us on Twitter at MotionPod. But for now, let's get into the show. It's our Christmas special where we sit down and talk about preprints that were mostly from this past year. It's Christmas! Or if you're not listening to this at Christmas, then it's a very dated show. Have you got your blanket all around you? You're nice and warm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I am. I'm tucked off under my blanket. I've got my little radiator going as well. It's oh, very cosy. Oh, very cosy. Sort of warm, relaxing, Christmassy atmosphere for the audience. You know, let's uh, imagine a crackling log fire. Well, I have my Christmas jumper on. So bad show from you guys. <laughs> okay. Are we? Are we actually ready then? Are we? Are we... So bets on John having further technical issues. <laughs> I'll take that bet. <laughs> Wish my computer would just not do things when I'm trying to do other stuff, like it just stop doing stuff in the background, computer. What are you eating, Emma? Well, I'm currently finished eating bourbon. Oh, bourbon. Okay, yeah. okay. I've got six more. You should have gone with the mince pies. Christmas spirit mm. and all that. Yeah, we had, we had the, someone bought a box of the Tesco's little ones for lunch the other day. I mean, I'm, I'm about three boxes into the mince pies no, no, no. this year already. Wow. Started in like September. I mean, like boxes of 12 as well, not boxes of six. <laughs> I mean, they appeared in the shops in somewhere in like September, October. Yeah, it was in, it was uh, early October because I was really annoyed they were doing the Christmas stuff before they did my birthday stuff. It was very rude of them. <laughs> I'm not getting a memo this year. Okay, so are we, are, we, are we now ready to start, do you think? Do you, I we, think we probably yeah? are. Should we, should we give it a try? I feel like I've tried three times already, but okay. Let's give it a whirl, girl. Oh. Oh, uh, cut that out. Don't leave that in for anyone who's from Liverpool <laughs> listening. What, what, when you, what, you go, uh, yeah. offend the whole of Merseyside in one go. No, I might leave that in. I'll never uh, go visit again. <laughs> I'm sure we've got enough listeners now we can insult some of them, right? I, I yeah, I can afford yeah. to lose a few. So, yeah, it's natural wastage. Okay, so good luck cutting this intro together. <laughs> Today, we are doing a bit of a Christmas special. But it turns out not a lot of people do Christmas preprints. Who'd have thought? You know, somebody out there should be studying Santa, but they're not. Ah, well, well, uh, oh, stay tuned. Okay. Oh, oh, have you found some? No, don't spoil it. Never mind. Sort uh, of. Sort <laughs> of. <laughs> so, Loosely. So instead of, of picking Christmas preprints, or maybe picking Christmas preprints, I certainly haven't. I did try to get them festive, but... Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did say you had one that was... Yeah, kind of, yeah okay. I, I did find one about someone who'd done... Um, transcriptome profiling of adipose tissue in reindeers that was about the closest oh, yeah, i got okay, I, 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 I haven't actually picked that one because it was oh. it was a little bit dry but but yeah that's that's the closest i got See, i didn't care i just went with the dry dry festive one <laughs> <laughs> like a cheap mince pie is, uh, really selling this episode <laughs> These mince pies are good ones. Uh, anyway, I was doing something about the, what we're doing this week. It's Christmas special. It's Christmas special. It's like special. a normal episode, but with a two drink minimum. That's uh, just, just so the audience are aware. Right. <laughs> so this week we will be talking about interesting preprints that have been posted this year. I'm hoping you both stuck to that. Uh, yes, I think they are both. Yep. I, in typical me fashion, have not read either of the papers I've chosen, but I have given them a quick skim, so I know roughly what they're on about. And mine is here to provoke discussion, so I'm... Very thankful I didn't have to read them. I've just realised one of mine isn't from this year, but never mind. It's, oh, that, it's got a festive crucial. title, so... <laughs> 2018. Oh, it's not even close. 18! Simpler times, you know, before the thing happened. Yeah, we're not mentioning that. No mention of the, the P or the C word today. Either C word. Well, that's annoying because one of my preprints is based on that. Oh, preprint was the P word. Oh. oh. Oh, I thought pandemic was the key. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought the pre-word was. Yeah. So anyway, we're going to talk about interesting preprints from this year, starting with Emma. What preprint did you choose? <laughs> um, I said, see, I said that with a mouthful of mince pie. This none of this is good. <laughs> so my preprint. So I was trying to get something that wasn't neuroscience. So I was basically just searching through bioarchive on any topic that wasn't neuroscience <laughs> to see if anything <laughs> struck me. Um, and I was quite um, intrigued by this preprint called Smart Soils to Observe Hidden Rhyhospheres Processes. I think that's how it's pronounced. Maybe not. So it's kind of talking about um, soil as being one of the most complex environments on the planet. 
and how basically we need it for agricultural production. And actually production is set to increase by about 50% between 2012 and up to 2050. Um, and we'll need that increase to, to achieve food security. But actually, I didn't think about this, but soil is apparently non-renewable. So actually we're using it up and it's not but it's not coming back. So this is in like the nutrients aren't renewable. Yeah, I didn't really think about it, to be honest. <laughs> oh yeah, so that, that's why um, so that's why farmers would take their crops. Yeah, I knew that, but like it, the fact that it's just completely like non-renewable and it's been lost faster than actually it's been generated. <laughs> like, as, well, as well as like rotating farmers, also there's um, you, you'll often see a field of like broad beans where they've basically like been grown and then just left, not harvested, and then it gets ploughed back in. It's because broad beans are really good at fixing nitrogen back into the soil. I think it is so. They're really good. But when you've had a really heavy, intense crop on a field and it's like completely depleted of nutrients, they tend to grow a cover crop of broad beans that they don't actually harvest and they just like plow it back in. Yeah. There you go. Farmer John, ladies and gentlemen. I know. Art. <laughs> so generally what this paper is looking at is how to measure like soil minerals and how do we know? So basically a lot of the ways that they do it now are quite... Um, well, they basically just dig it up. <laughs> it kind of damages it <laughs> a little bit. So they're kind of looking at non-invasive ways. Um, so they've actually made this kind of fluoropolymer that can change color depend like it's a sensor basically so it's like soil that can actually grow plants or be mixed in with soil that can grow plants and it, they showed like a little lettuce leaf growing out the top in one of the figures which i thought was very cute <laughs> and they basically tested um how well like tested to see what the ph so basically when the ph increases you get more blue fluorescence so they can this can be applied to many different nutrients throughout like different soils so it basically allow farmers and industrial food production and um, to know what's in the soil and what's going on so this one's just focused on ph but they said they can use it for lots of different things and it could be to quantify biological and chemical changes of the soil environment that was going to be my next question <laughs> i'm going to do a call back and ask you a microbiome question again oh really what would well, what well so presumably the microbiome within soil that's obviously that's very very diverse but presumably that changes depending on things like crop being grown and that i imagine would have quite an impact on soil fertility yeah i guess so um and, and that's basically the point they want to kind of measure that i guess so they can be like oh in this soil we can we need to add more nitrogen like that broad bean thing and then otherwise not so much um and help them understand the biodiversity um and hopefully they say to promote new forms of indoor farming they basically use this they use kind of like a waste like waste plastic um to generate called fluoropolymers and they used waste FEP of a long chemical I can't pronounce, and um, which is basically produced from industrial tubings and coatings. So they actually, I quite like the idea that they're using something that's a waste of another industry to make this this compound. And they have like basically a sensor incorporated, so you can put whatever sensor you wanted into it. Cool, cool soil. Cool, basically cool soil. And I quite like I quite like this paper simply because it was kind of like a new tool to understand a problem. I quite like new tools being made. And I think it's quite applicable to lots of different, well, because it's not, could just, it could work on pH or it can work on like, I don't know, nitrogen levels and it could be quite variable. So, I mean, not the most, I mean, I quite liked it. <laughs> and it's definitely not neuroscience. <laughs> it's definitely not neuroscience. Is your other one neuroscience one? Um, I have like three to choose from. Oh, oh maybe you can do more. Actually, I have four one. to choose from. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I feel this is a very good, exercise in our personalities isn't it <laughs> i haven't bothered at all john's <laughs> kind of half arsed it and you've gone full blown you've covered us both <laughs> well i panicked i was like i didn't know if it was going to be like a journal club i was like i need to know more about this <laughs> but yeah if you're into plant sciences go for, go for have a look at this uh, fancy new soil and it'll be in the links and we can we we can point down to the links but no one can see us pointing oh yeah go to the links i'll put them in the show notes go on then farmer john now that you've read your abstract. <laughs> I, I don't know what you mean. I completely and thoroughly read this paper beforehand. Uh, no, this, this, this is quite interesting. This was, um, so obviously, I, for people who don't know, I'm, I'm not quite interested in uh, RNA interference. That's what I did my PhD on. So I'm kind of quite interested in double stranded RNA and all the weird things it, it does. Um, and this, this is the thing where basically um, it turns out that, so, okay, so we'll, we'll start from the beginning. So the thing's called stress granules in cells, right? That for people that don't know, are basically collections of sort of sequestered RNA and proteins that basically when the cell is slightly stressed, it kind of like a subset of the messenger RNA gets kind of pegged away so that it's, it doesn't translate into, into protein, but it's kind of there ready for if the cell then becomes no longer stressed, unstressed. 
And it turns out that in response to um, double-stranded RNA being detected in the cell, which is usually obviously from a, a byproduct of a virus uh, reproducing, um, there are basically immune receptors that will uh, bind the double-stranded RNA and basically sort of sequester it away into stress granules. So it's not necessarily just messenger RNA in there. There might be, you know, it might, might kind of put double-stranded uh, double RNA away as well. What are stress granules? <laughs> I just explained what a stress granule was. Did you? Did you <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I genuinely wasn't listening. I, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> sorry. I, literally just explained I thought that was a really good was. question. Well, I'll explain it again, <laughs> and uh, wh whichever is the better Thanks, explanation, I'll, I'll keep, and we, we can we can lose the other one. So, uh, so stress granules are collections of basically protein and messenger RNA, where the basically messenger RNA gets kind of a proportion, it gets sort of sequestered away when a uh, cell becomes slightly stressed in some way, shape, or form. Heat shock proteins, then, right? They're a stress protein, maybe. I don't know. It's, 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 I think there's all sorts of proteins in, in there potentially. Like, like in this one, it's talking about like certain like um, types of like immune receptor that end up like that get traffic there somehow. I guess the point is here that it's not just messenger RNA when the cell is stressed, but it's also when it's detecting viral double stranded RNA. It's going, oh, this is not good, and it's also sequestering that away in um, in stress granules. <laughs> Sorry to bring it to neuroscience again, but I'm sure these are in uh, ALS. I'm sure there's yes. stress granules in ALS. And uh, there's another kind of granule which i can't remember what it's called that's in muscular dystrophy okay yeah i apply for a postdoc on this at st andrews which i didn't get but <laughs> shout out to st andrews there there you go <laughs> <laughs> had hannah's as a neighbor though so you know so. <laughs> <laughs> so in your paper they're detecting viruses they are um they're showing that basically um that stress granules form in response to double-stranded rna being detected i think that's the first time that anyone's shown that basically, I think is, is, is the gist of it. So it's not just messenger RNA sort of tucked away in the stress granules. It's also, you know, the viral double stranded RNA also ends up in there, apparently, if I'm interpreting it correctly, as I'm doing now on the hoof. Based on the abstract. <laughs> <laughs> is this yeah. something that can be applicable to kind of any disease relevance or whatever you're doing? Fly relevant? Mosquito relevant? It, oh, mosquitoes. no, it's not, it's, not, it's not related to mine. No, no, no. But, um, oh. Oh, yeah, as they say, it highlights the role that stress granules play in regulating the delicate balance between the type 1 interferon response and cell death. So, the, so yeah, so when, when double-stranded RNA kind of stimulates the formation of these kind of stress granules, it basically a load of, so where are you, things like Rig1, uh, light receptors, kinase R, those kind of things um, get kind of incorporated into the stress granules, basically, which I believe are all part of the, yeah, because, uh, yeah, because uh, Rig1 light receptors are part of the uh, interferon 1 pathway. Can you explain the interferon? Not complexly, but you yeah. just, what is the interferon? I can never remember the difference between type the... type one and type two interferon. Uh, uh, Johnny will have to help me out here. It's the immune response, right? Yes, it's does it the one that upregulates and downregulates certain genes in response to to the virus. I think, if I remember rightly. Have a Google somewhere. <laughs> Johnny looks quite smug. Again, I, I, I applied for a postdoc on this and it's, it's gone in one ear and out. You're, 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 not, you're not far off. Could draw the pathway out from memory at one point. <laughs> so interferons are big in signaling for the immune system. Different interferons will do your pro or anti-inflammatory responses. Type 1 interferons are released from all cells, I think. And type 2 interferons are released in response to specific cytokines. And it's, okay, so type 2 are restricted to immune cells okay. as a response to certain cytokines. There you go. So all cells can produce type 1, only immune cells can produce type 2. Although I bet that's not true. I remember remembering this right. Is the type 1 pathway the thing where it, like, shuts down translation in neighbouring cells as part of the response to, to, like, stop a virus in its tracks? Nice. Sorry. Can't help. Have to do some research. <laughs> some, of that, some of that background reading you may have wanted to, to have done beforehand. Yes. Again, crying over data. <laughs> it's got pushed down the list a bit. <laughs> so the stress granules have what effect on the interferon pathways? Increasing them. Increase one, decrease the other? Well, they, they, they contain key proteins that are part of the pathway. I think they're oh, sort of okay. suppressed away. And, oh, yeah. So, yeah so, sorry. So it targets those those proteins and also the double-stranded RNA for autophagy, basically. Okay, okay. And it's also obviously sequestering away the viral RNA as well at the same time, uh, rather than letting it run loose around the cell or something. So. That's cool. So I guess it's kind of a... It's compensating the initial response you would have then, right? It's kind of, if it's sequestering them away, it's dampening the response. Cool. Why did you choose the paper? It had double-stranded RNA in it. It was recent. <laughs> and it has stress granules in it. And I, again, I applied for something a long time ago. It was on a type of, like, a subtype of stress granule. So I was just like, oh, I know oh, this you've stuff. You've gotten everything. <laughs> and then, yes, I've forgotten everything. It's just, uh, well, it's just the thing. It's the thing. Anyone out there who's applied for lots of PhDs oh, or you forget in a row... You immediately forget what uh, what what the previous thing was on. Like, yeah, I, I could I could draw the interferon pathway from memory nearly at one point, and I 
now like the Krebs cycle we all remember it <laughs> we all forget it then we all remember it again and then we all forget it for life I, I have glycolysis memorized I think I think we'll always have glycolysis memorized yeah you don't need to memorize glucose, glucose 6 phosphate fructose no, we 6 don't know we don't we do not nobody nobody wants to listen fructose to you wants recite the glycolysis pathway glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate this is getting edited out yeah <laughs> <sighs> okay so what about you Johnny what can yeah. you bring to the table so- I bought my soil you bought your soil. John has bought John's- half-baked knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> half, half-remembered scientific facts. Yes. I'm about to bring yet more half-baked knowledge. So the first one I'm going to talk about, chosen this one because, it, to be honest, it was the first one I found that mentioned the thing I want to talk about. And also, it, it's one of the most, it, within its category, one of the most downloaded from the year. So assume some people will have read it, apparently. But I haven't. But I have read the abstract. So this one is a structural biology community assessment of AlphaFold2 applications. The reason I wanted to talk about this is because AlphaFold2, probably like the big pandemic stuff aside, the big thing in science this year, I guess, has been AlphaFold2. So AlphaFold2 is this AI-based software tool developed by the guys who create Google. Alphabet. I hate saying that, though, because it seems weird if someone's developed. Anyway, Alphabet made AlphaFold2. And they released this out into the community freely, I think, um, which is very nice of them because, you know, they have enough money anyway. And basically what this does is it allows you to, well, it predicts uh, the characteristics of proteins and the folding properties. And this therefore allows us to create sort of more hypothesis driven research, particularly because a lot of the current mechanisms of looking at sort of protein folding and, and proteins in 3D are not always that great. So what this paper did was with a structural biology focus. Basically, they compared AlphaFold2 to the the current sort of protein databases to see if it was better or not. And basically, they found, yes, it was a a lot better. So basically, they showed that this is better at predicting protein disorders and protein complexes compared to any state-of-the-art tools currently used for those purposes. Don't know what those current tools are. I've known how to do this. What would you use this for? Like beyond just looking at protein complexes? So this could be maybe you want to look at a certain part of the protein to target. So if you're thinking about enzyme binding, that yeah. kind of thing, you could t- then this allows you to zone in a little bit more on sort of what you would target. It could be used in things like development of therapeutics and those kind of molecules where you need to look it's at more the, like the pharma form. quite handy for handy for that i mean i've it's been on it's gotten a lot of rounds on twitter in terms of use for i mean there is because there, there are some uh, i mean I, i've used one it didn't i'm not sure it worked very well but there are some online tools where you can sort of basically put in a protein sequence mm. and it runs it so so fire and i think it's all around fire 2 now is an online tool for that just predicts protein folding based mm. on just the sequence alone basically similar thing to alpha fold in that respect but then there's there's online tools that will then take that structure created by fire and go and look for where there might be a ligand binding site for example and kind of you know putative sites where something might bind and then you can yeah for finding drug targets no i mean the other thing that this is really good for is things where we can't do crystallization of proteins which we can't do for a surprising amount of proteins so this being a better tool to actually visualize them or predict them in 3d is very helpful for just thinking about how things work as well right so last week's episode with hannes he was talking about the the protein complex he's studying and how things bind together so this would be quite useful in that and sort of helping people think about how these things are actually joining up together things like how cells bind themselves together right that's all done through tethering through proteins and far too many lab meetings with the strut lab for years on end that's a very complex are we process. cutting that bit out <laughs> i don't think they listen so you can leave it in um and that's, so if we do leave it in they were studying cell polarity not cell binding but sort of how a cell determines which way is one side of a cell and which way is the other side of the cell um, but that it's like an incredibly complex pathway of like lots of different things that bind to one another um so it'd be really useful in all that kind of stuff i imagine but yeah there you go alpha fold free advert for it that sounds really cool I, I have enjoyed some of the uh, the kind of alpha fold bloopers that I've seen online of like where it just can't quite get a certain protein. It does all sorts of weird things. It doesn't quite know what to do. And of course, we, you know, some some parts of proteins are intrinsically disordered. They're not in any kind of secondary structure. Mm-hmm. They're just sort of flopping around deliberately so. And so it doesn't really kind of know what to do with those, I think. But that's, I mean, that's okay because, you know, they, they could be anywhere at any time. That, that region of the protein could be at any angle, any confirmation. Well, prions, right? Just... Just bits of protein, not necessarily yeah. in a nice structure. And they cause all kinds of problems for us. Mainly mad cow disease is the one I guess most people would know. Kruzfeld Jakob, is that that's the human equivalent, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Have I said that right? <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I have no idea if you're right or not. I, it sound, it's ringing some bells, so I think you're right. 
Do a quick Google. Um, no, I think you're right. There you go. So there's there's the first three. Emma has mm. another three in her back pocket. John's, I think, flicking through his second one right now. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, this one's a lot easier to explain, uh, so it's fine. What, what, what are you going to say, Emma? Just... I was going to say, I was going to, I can ask, I can read out the titles that I have, and then you can choose which one I talk about next. Oh, yeah, go on, do that. It's a bit we're not live, we can do a phoning competition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I've got, this is the neuroscience one, early diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, a cross-species biomarker, uh, snow microbiome functional analysis reveals novel microbial my, my, bleh, metabolism of complex organic compounds. Um, that's the soil one that I've just read out. And circulating mitochondrial DNA is an early indicator of severe in- illness and mortality from COVID-19. Ooh. I, I mean, the snow one sounds interesting, but then I also quite like the mitochondria. The mitochondria one I'm kind of intrigued by as well. I would have voted for the mitochondria one as well. Oh, well, good. That was the one I was actually going to talk about. So oh, there we go. Out. Let's go, mitochondria <laughs> then. You can check out the other two online, people. <laughs> <laughs> so just generally, I guess, I mean, one of the main reasons I chose this one is I work on mitochondria and I'm quite interested in ER mitochondria contact sites. And also, obviously, we can't get away from COVID-19. And I thought it was quite interesting that uh, mitochondrial DNA could actually be an early indicator of um, the virus. So it's the idea that viral infections can trigger cellular necrosis, which can inhibit viral replication, so stop it amplifying. Um, and this is through the release of damage-associated molecular patterns, or DAMPs, to trigger innate response. Please uh, correct me if You're I'm right. wrong. You're right. You're doing good so far. Yes. <laughs> Damp- DAMPs, the other big ones, PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Ah, okay. But DAMPs. And so- Apparently, and I did not know this, mitochondrial DNA is a type of mitochondrial damp released by injured or dying cells. Um, and it's actually been shown to be elevated in sepsis, uh, as well as during um, even sterile injury um, and trauma. And, and generally, you'll release uh, inflammatory cytokines and ROS to facilitate neurophil trafficking. So how does um, how, how does other cells or whatever in the body uh, detect that the bit of random DNA that's just floated past is mitochondrial DNA rather than just genomic DNA? I don't know. <laughs> I don't really study mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so, so normal DNA will elicit the same kind of response. So, I, I wonder, wonder if it is wonder if it is a separate pathway. Or if it is just it's detecting exogenous DNA. I don't know. I want to do a quick Google while Emma keeps talking. Okay. So, this study in particular looked at COVID COVID nineteen patients with high circulating mitochondrial DNA and found that, that those with high circulating mitochondrial DNA are higher risk for mortality or require ICU admission or intubation. So this preference suggests it may be a way to preempt the disease. So it, and mitochondrial DNA could be a measure of inflammation of COVID-19 patients and correlate with emerging markers of COVID-19 sensitivity. And basically they just show that it can result in the severity of the disease, but it is a marker for it. So it may highlight people who are at higher risk of death to so potentially go on the list for booster shots, potentially. Um, so basically if they got it out early, they'd be able to be like you definitely need to go get um another vaccination basically but it was quite a simple study um i guess just looking at patients and looking at correlating um this mitochondrial dna with mortality which is quite sad <laughs> and like covid 19 icu admissions but we do need more people to get those jabs and the boosters. yeah so because i mean i guess it could be a different way after you've done age and stuff it could be well i don't know how easy it is actually to detect mitochondrial dna but they seem to have done it on a fairly high throughput-ish scale. Mm-hmm. So, because then I guess if you've got people that are over 60 or whatever and have this marker, you could be like, right, you you go now <laughs> to go get it. Which could also help people who are a bit reluctant to get the jab because they seem to think that they've had it once so it's going to give them lifelong protection. Or they've had mm-hmm. the disease so it's going to give them lifelong protection, not realising that's not quite how the immune system always works. Well, we've always had it with vaccinations, right? With, um, what was it, tetanus? You have to get tetanus boosters. So it's not, a, the boosters aren't a new thing. I don't know where people are like, oh, I'm, have, I'm protected forever. <laughs> well, I think it's it's part of the, the, the whole conspiracy of big pharma trying to make money off people. This is, I had this discussion today talking about, uh, basically, the, 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 so this is the, there's the new variant in South Africa. Yeah. That is supposed to be, it's got quite a lot of mutations doing it. It looks like it might be quite dangerous certainly looks like it's a really, really transmissible. The flip side, of course, for being positive is that it's really transmissible, but way less dangerous. So that's generally how it works, right? Generally. Yeah, I mean, you know, vi- it, evolution, right? It, things that survive will generally not kill the host. They don't want to do that. Because they want to replicate, right? So you don't want to kill the thing you're replicating. So so the, that we were talking about it through, through that angle, but the person I was talking to seems to suggest that 
this isn't a real thing. It's just something that's being said so that more people get their vaccines and the boosters. So that big pharma make more money from it. Uh, quick note, I'm pretty sure up until now, they have not made any money off their vaccine. They've sold it at cost. I, th- I think most of them have, actually. Yeah. Although, not to give them too much prop, a lot of them have also way hiked the prices to the developing countries where it's really, really needed. They are not giving it for free, or I don't, I'm don't. i not even sure they're giving it at cost, to be honest. I don't think they are anymore. No. Uh, so the place where the vaccines desperately needed are sadly and predictably not going to be getting it for another year or so. Not properly anyway. So has John had time to scan his next paper, or do you want me to go? Yes, I have. <laughs> okay, then you take it away, dear. So this was, I started searching uh, festive things on BioArchive. And I tried like, I, found, I, found, I found things about like migration patterns of reindeer and fir tree forests that were, were very exciting. Did you find the paper that was like, what's under the Christmas tree? Oh, I did not. No? no. Hold on, hold on. They were, they, so it sounds like there were actually quite a few Christmassy preprints we could have chosen. And yeah. neither of you chose them. I did. I've written up my snow one. I can talk about that afterwards if you want. <laughs> yeah, we can have a bonus one. <laughs> I mean, I don't know a lot about it. But... I start, So I started searching lots of different things on, on BioArchive. And eventually I was just thought, for a laugh, I just thought, I'll search Santa, see what comes up. Uh, and it threw up this, which has got nothing to do with Christmas at all. But the, the program they've developed is called Santa Sim. So that was just quite fun, which I imagine a little cartoon Santa running around that you can like lock in the refrigerator or drown in the swimming pool santa sim yeah. <laughs> there we go that was lock, the sound of the lock, penny lock, dropping lock for about a, a mile lock in a room and take the door yeah. out and then set a fire yeah <laughs> great game still anyway we'll cut we'll cut the bit where you sound like a serial color out shall we <laughs> that's I, i'm sure that was in their marketing for the game at one point yeah. Anyway, uh, so I have combed this paper top to bottom and I can't find what the acronym Santa Sim actually stands for anywhere in this paper, but I can tell you what it does. Uh, so Santa Sim is basically it's a software package that will basically look at the kind of evolution over time within a population of basically, well, it says, you know, very generally to be with gene sequences. It's kind of particularly geared to haploid genomes, so it's very good for RNA viruses. Um, and now this uh, this paper came out in 2018, so just before the, 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 pan- the pandemic. And so little did they know, and I wonder how much use this program has actually had like uh, during the course of the pandemic. But yes, but basically it's instead of kind of just modeling the thing as one whole process, it basically separately models kind of, you know, the replication of the, of the genome sequence, top possible kind of recombination, point mutations. It can model, you know, insertion deletion type mutations as well. And also, you know, kind of that under various selection pressures as well. And, and, and also it does... It'll handle kind of host pathogen type interactions. So you can look at how two sort of sequences that are, you know, kind of doing something to each other. So a particular gene that's maybe involved in viral response in, in, in a mammalian host, and then the, the viral gene in itself. And you can look at how they kind of mutate around each other in an arms race, um, which I think, again, is something new that this software did that no other one has sort of so far been able to do. But yeah, and it just, yeah, it just again, because it's you know, one of the things they kind of labor is that is the point about RNA viruses. And obviously with COVID, this is again, quite, uh, quite interesting. I would be interested actually to go back and have a, a bit of a dig around and see what, uh, see if this has been used much for kind of, yeah, especially, you know, kind of mutations on the spike protein and, you know, mutations on uh, or natural variation in the ACE2 receptor. You know, that could be a good example of maybe something where this could be used. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to do a little, but I've had more time, <laughs> uh, done a little follow up and have, had a look for, uh, well, for I'd, I'd be surprised because I, I just get a quick Google and I also couldn't figure out what the hell Santa stands for. So no. <laughs> if nobody if nobody can figure out what it stands for, I can't imagine they're using it. I mean, I, I should say it's uh, uh, it's available on, uh, on on GitHub. It's uh, open source and, and free to use. So I might I might go have a little might go have a little explore of that later. Do you know I, I, don't, use, I don't profess do you know how to be how the use best. GitHub? Very vaguely. I don't profess to be the world's best uh, bioinformatician or coder by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, far from it, in fact. But uh, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd carve my lab book on a stone tablet if I could, but um, who needs Zoom when you've got uh, carrier visions? Yeah, anyway, but, uh, but yeah, I will have a little look and, and see, if, see, see if even a simpleton like me can manage to work out the technology and, and play around with it a bit. But yeah, I'd be interested to do a, a kind of a follow-up search and see if it's been used for anything much around the pandemic, because it sounds like it would be prime for it. But it had Santa in the title as well. We like it's got nothing to do with Christmas, which has just made me sad, no. to be honest. You're ruining my Christmas uh, You spirit. could... You could look at the uh, selection pressures that might result in uh, the pigmentation of a reindeer's nose turning uh, yeah. towards red or, or, mm. or randomly producing a, a fluorescent protein that allows it to caress in the dark. You know, there's... there's. 
Had a bacterial yeah, infection, that's... that's what it was. <laughs> it was just massively inflamed. R- Rudolph was an alcoholic, that's why his nose was red, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually him drinking all that uh, all that port and brandy and uh-huh. mince pies. <laughs> Not Santa at all. Well, now that we've ruined Christmas for everyone... <laughs> <laughs> Santa's real children, we promise. Uh, Although, if you're not listening in December, then it doesn't matter that Santa doesn't stand for Santa. There you go. I, I am frustrated that I can't find what it stands for. It, it, I, it yeah, I thought... It anywhere in the paper. It wasn't, and I, I, would have, I would have thought a quick Google search would have helped, but it really didn't. Not... <laughs> nobody, nobody has defined Santa that I, I was able to find there. I mean, presumably sim is simulation, but what the Santa Simul- actually Yeah, sim like. is... I, well, I think... Yeah, I think what they've I think they've taken random letters out of what it, it actually yeah. is to make sense. It's all it's all just it's all capitalized. It's not there's no lowercase letters in between, no. which is usually what happens when you like yeah. yeah. So I oh well the mystery continues. The mystery of Santa continues. Was it at least released in December? June. No. <laughs> <laughs> very, very not Christmassy. Although to be fair, to be fair, when you're doing you know, when you're doing like Christmas episodes and crap, you normally record those in the summer. Like all the famous Christmas songs were largely recorded in the summer, so maybe they're actually just getting in there early. Is this, is this where you're giving away the magic that we're actually recording this in November, <laughs> this episode? Yeah, I, yeah, I thought you were going to say summer. No, it is November. Yeah. <laughs> and I've already been listening to Christmas songs for 26 days now. There you go. Yeah, I've had a few on. My Santa hat on my head every day while I'm at work. People is it? giving me Ooh. very funny looks. I mean, I'm not surprised. I haven't worn a Santa hat into work yet. I might start doing that. I, I was sad because I, my data was terrible the other day uh, yeah. so i stuck i finally got around to sticking googly eyes on my centrifuge that was that was how i showed myself up <laughs> <I mean. laughs> <That's cute. laughs> so we've got we've got no decorations for christmas at work like at all it's pathetic really i i helped put the decorations up in our office and i immediately broke the star <laughs> so it went and i had to go out and buy a new one <laughs> christmas was momentarily cancelled oh, in the lstm I, office it i've was, spent uh, i've basically spent the past two weeks making and folding paper stars for the office so the office is littered with paper stars that i've sat and folded myself now because the only thing i'm able to make out of paper that's christmasy and then i bought 50 feet of tinsel which arrived this week so i'm wow. just gonna stick tinsel everywhere in the office but yeah and my christmas Classy. hat I'm, I'm the christmas one in the office i've got my, my santa hat on okay paper well preprint number six isn't it so yeah, yeah good i wasn't sure i'd done my counting correctly is, is, that, is that you going or is that you no i was about to start i was about to start Ah. We, were, we were at a pub quiz uh, this week as well, and one of the questions was, um, what's the total number if you add up the, the titles of each of Adele's albums? <laughs> we managed to get... That's what happened? You preprint it, son. <laughs> we managed to get all of the numbers correct, but we added it up wrong, so we didn't get the point. Uh, what anyway, was it, like 16, 19? I think it's 95, I think, or 75. I think we might have put 75 and it was 95. 19, 21, 30... 25. 25. There, yeah. there was it's a problem of the day where um, I think the question was what's the what's the distance to the to the sun in kilometers and I, I know it in miles I know it's 93 million miles but I've no idea what it is in kilometers but then someone else knew what the conversion factor was which I think is eight over five or something so then we, we were sat there literally work with like multiplying 93 by eight and then dividing it by five and to get the approximate answer and we were very very close we we're only a couple of kilometers out uh, and this is what happens when the nerds go do the pub quiz <laughs> <laughs> what are your favorite? <laughs> yeah, well, one of the other questions we got, just because this was, I thought it was a weird one. One of the, the question was between 2000 and 2009, what was the biggest selling album? Adele. She She's up there, I think, now. I haven't fact checked this. Oh, I guess 2000, 2009 is probably quite early in her career. Mm. Ed Sheeran? Gaga? Gaga could be one. No, it she's later. It, she was it, this one. It was James Blunt. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> Sorry if James Blunt Apparently. Uh, you're not that bad. No, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. Number two was Dido. Bloody hell, music was bad in the naughty. And then uh, number three was my guess, which was Back to Black, which was Amy Winehouse. Uh, but yeah, James uh, Blunt. Of course. There you go. Anyway, sorry, yes. Preprints and that, that kind of stuff. I tried to bring it back. But I know, like, I, I, you know, I ignored you. Your quiz more. I thought we should, we, should just, we should have just done a pub quiz. Forget the preprints. Yeah, we should have just done a pub quiz. <laughs> right, I'm not going to eat a mince pie as I start to talk. Right, okay. So the, the second one I chose, I chose mainly as a as a discussion point because uh, I think it's I think I've mentioned it already on the show before, and it's one of those things we might have covered if there was a bit more to the preprint. I don't think there's quite enough to do a whole episode on it. So this is nepotistic journals, uh, a survey of biomedical journals. This weirdly enough was published this week. Uh, I, I, I popped up on my Twitter when I was just scrolling around. So there you go. It's been published this week. 
And basically what the authors have done here is they have extracted the, the sort of metadata behind all the biomedical journals that were referencing whatever library that is they've used. And they've done this between 2015 and 2019. And then they've calculated the percentage of papers by the most prolific author. So these are the authors who are just publishing the most during that period. And they've used some other uh, indexes as well to kind of rank things a little bit. And what their premise is basically is that you can use the percentage of papers by the most prolific author or PPMP. So they're kind of stealing our little acronym for the podcast. Right? But, uh, you can use that as a red flag to identify journals that might be a bit suspect. And it's really interesting because one of the other things that, so I can bring this back to the pandemic thing is you both mentioned pandemic stuff now. Um, one of the interesting things that's come out certainly the past year or so has been the explosion of paper mills and journals that will basically publish any old crap. And it's not being well challenged by the publication industry at the moment. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the publication industry won't like that statement, but they're not doing a very good job. But it has been flagged quite a lot lately. And so if we have ways of identifying potentially suspect journals, that's always a good thing. And perhaps even better if we can identify the suspect authors, that's perhaps more important. And again, there's been a lot of high profile cases lately where people have lost their funding because they're have basically just been making it up the entire time. Now, happily, uh, what they find is that the vast majority of the journals they looked at were absolutely fine. Um, but they did find a few where it suggested that this was in a, a way of identifying a problem. And interestingly, particularly in the light of the pandemic, one of the, their, in their discussion, they say, our results reveal a subset of journals where a few authors, often members of the editorial board, were responsible for a disproportionate number of publications and that these were more likely to be accepted for publi publication within three weeks of submission, uh, which brings us right back quite nicely to the whole hydroxychloroquine issue early in the pandemic, uh, which is a case where editors were leaned on or were authors and that got published the day it was, sort of, well, the day after it was released. Uh, I didn't realise that was, that it was yeah, I didn't realize that. published in their own journal sort of thing. Yeah, so it's it's often sort of sold as one of those preprints that we need that make us all be wary of preprints. Um, but it was posted as a preprint, I think, the day before it was published. Supposed to all those papers that need to make us be wary of yeah. papers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Looking at you, NG Argonaut. <laughs> <laughs> it was the day, it was posted, I think it was posted the day before it was published. And then it might have been a YouTube thing or, maybe, or maybe just the university website. But basically, they published a, a, like their version of a preprint before that as well. Um, but yeah, very quick turnaround. Um, and yeah, it was the, the, um, can't remember if it's one of the authors or if it's one of the lab members is the editor of the journal it went to. And when this has been looked into by people, wonderful people like um, Elizabeth Bick, basically they found a history of that certain person who I won't name because he sues everyone. He, he has a history of doing this and, and sort of getting his work accepted into uh, papers where he knows the editors or he is the editor or he can lean on the editors which is a massive problem in publishing anyway. But what, when I was reading this, so this is the, well, I say reading it. When I was reading the abstract of this, this is one of those preprints that has some comments associated with it. So I did read the comments and it was quite a nice sort of mini review where they brought up some good points. And one of the things they mentioned was that actually a lot of the things that this paper has picked up on are editorials. And so they've, they've mentioned that the fact that, that an editorial might sort of skew the results a little bit, because of course it will, it's by editors and they, they can, Post many one. But I think that also brings up another important point, which is the use of editorials as a way of getting around peer review. All those journals that have these sort of streams for publishing that where you don't have your papers peer reviewed, but still published as a paper, which has caused a lot of confusion again during the pandemic, where certain very incorrect papers were published through those streams and then sold as this is something that's been really good. And because people aren't aware of that, they assume it's been peer reviewed and it's all up to scratch and it hasn't been. So yeah, I thought that I thought it was a very interesting paper to generate discussion over some of the practices that people don't seem to think are dodgy but actually really are quite dodgy in uh, academia so what journals did they find that were oh it's a, i haven't Methodist read it i don't know <laughs> i don't know if they oh, name well, and shame uh, well let's see if we can find them journal selection uh well, we're not naming shaming we're just repeating what this paper has found this is true this is true don't sue us thank you <laughs> <laughs> you can only be sued if you say something that isn't factually correct right um yeah okay so i don't think they do name the journals that's probably fair they probably um, would get sued if they, <laughs> they so, did the, name so the, the figures are like the kind of stuff you'd see with rna seq data like it's not a well i guess a bit like fax data actually 
Um, so they've plotted the two different things they're looking at on each axis, and then each dot, I guess, would be a pay, uh, journal. Mm. So you can't you can't see, you can't pull out the names, but you can see the the distribution quite nicely. And then they've got one where they've identified the outliers in it, and it, yeah, but yeah. So I mean, it's not necessarily the best way of identifying these kind of journals, but it is a good way of doing it. Um, but yeah, so I thought that was a, a a good thing for people to think about. I didn't even know that there was these editorial streams until you literally just said. Mm. Like I wasn't no, I really this. aware that you could get it through without peer review. I literally thought so, you. Who is it? It's one of the big clinical journals. Do it. They were the ones that were in trouble most recently for the, that, the paper I was talking about. There's a good one. So the BMJ actually last week I think did a good did this in a, a I guess a good way. So there's a Guardian headline last week. Guardian big newspaper in the UK and worldwide, but mainly in the UK. Um, they had a headline that was so masks are have a 53 percent efficacy in stopping the virus and it was kind of annoying because on twitter obviously this was shared a lot by those people who are pro math which is not a bad thing but it was very clear they hadn't actually read the paper they just read the headline and i think when you have scientists who are sharing stuff they should really read the paper because then it throws their whole authority in doubt if they're just sharing shit that's not entirely correct. You, you mean like how we've carefully read all of these preprints that we're now talking about on this episode? <laughs> yeah, but we're, we're, we're not we're not sell, we're not saying this is good quality stuff. You should go make decisions we're around the pandemic. Merely drawing attention to them. Yes, for people to make their own informed decisions. Certainly, a lot of what I've seen on Twitter were people who were going, "Well, actually, this backs up what I've been saying." So there was a really good one from the Financial Times data analyst guy, John Bernard Murdoch. I think that's his name, uh, who, if you don't follow on Twitter, you're really sure he's amazing. Um, he did a lot of, well, he still does a lot of, like, the really good graphics of how the pandemic's progressing and that kind of stuff. But basically, he looked into this one a little bit more behind the headline, and then he did a little series of tweets that sort of called out all these people because they were just sharing the headline. So I went and found the BMG article. So the article itself is quite flawed. Um, it, I should say it's published with the peer review, so you can see what other people thought of it. It's a lot of work, but they excluded a lot of so it's a meta-analysis, and they excluded a lot of the studies looking at masks that were a bit more robust studies. Why? Did they give reasons for that? They give a lot of reasons why things were excluded. And I'm not... I mean, it, it's a difficult thing to study because you can't separate out mask wearing as a single variable. So I understand that is difficult, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced they should have done this. But basically, one of the peer reviewers wrote an editorial that was published alongside that article in the issue of the BMJ. And the editorial basically breaks down a lot of the problems with the article, which kind of questions why the journal would publish it, but it was a lot of work and it still is useful. Um, but yeah, so th there's an example of an editorial that's actually done quite well, I guess. It's kind of showing the limitations to an article that the article itself wasn't being super forthcoming about. But I think that's a case where they perhaps saw the headlines and tried to head it off, but failed because people just pick up on the headline but yeah but yeah uh, ed yeah the editorial stream is a horrible thing that should not exist but it does and it, it of course the people who are editors of journals are largely those who are the big profs in the field who really don't need any help publishing articles certainly not pushing them through without any kind of scrutiny um but yeah they, they it's, it's used a lot and it's something people need to think a bit more yeah so should we go back to emma to do one more of emma's no it's no, okay are we done know. was there any like key takeaway fact from the snow one so like a, it's like a fun, snow. fun so, takeaway. Snow microbiome, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, so basically, they were saying, I'll just, I'll just talk about it. Um, <laughs> they, um, so basically, lots of things cause stress on microorganisms, temperature, pressure, pH, uh, especially in extreme environments. But um, they haven't really studied much to do with the cold or the cryosphere, as they call it, which is extreme cold environment that covers a large proportion of the surface of the world and mainly found at the poles, I guess. It's okay, we're getting rid of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, if organisms are active at below zero temperatures in the snow, then they are likely to involve a range of processes involving organic matter, which could impact atmospheric and biogeo uh, cycles. So they basically obtained 20 snow samples and got genomic and transcriptomic data for each sample and compared early and late spring samples pretty much and found that um, early spring samples were more diverse more diverse than late spring samples. And this is particularly important. So it's only quite brief. It's kind of important because um, I guess like we found, you know, like polymerases for PCR, they want to understand novel enzymes that could potentially be hidden in these in this snow. So they detected many genes in the environmental ice mega mega genomes <laughs> uh, related to carbon sources and suggest that glacial ice microorganisms have the potential to de degrade a wide range of substrates. So they're potentially looking for more industrial basically industrial processes and stuff. So it's not the most like, you know, Christmassy. That's snow in <laughs> but it, it though. But it's snow. And they, yeah. 
So is 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 late spring colder then? I would say late spring's warmer, wouldn't it? Yeah, early yeah, spring. Yeah. yeah, that makes yeah. sense then. Yeah, that that fits to my <laughs> thinking because I, I was wondering why they would die off when it gets colder. Yeah, as it warms up. The, mm, yeah, yeah, then they, yeah. I think they say they said in early spring there was a higher diversity of core or organisms with only a fraction actually being active but later on as it gets warmer i think they become more active and it becomes more competitive so it actually becomes uh, less diverse ah uh, right okay i like that we did the same sound there <laughs> <laughs> okay there you go we got we got some Christmassy stuff in that then <laughs> Christmassy ish <laughs> ish how do we end this one i was gonna say is there any any general Christmassy chat we can do what what, what, what i don't know like um how how how, how is everyone's science affected by christmas uh, uh, it's gonna stop. Yeah, I'm not gonna be there. <laughs> but basically, I I am killing a lot of mice at the moment. Is how it's going. Oh, we, we're doing like twenty a week. It's horrible. God. I mean, they're being used for big experiments. They're not just being. Killed. Oh. See, we, we uh, yeah, we, we, we keep our, all our uh, mosquito lines fully going and stuff over. Uh, Does someone over have to Christmas. come in like they did with flies? Yeah, a big so yeah, mm. big a big shout out to all the technicians at LSTM who will be in at various points over the Christmas holidays looking after mosquitoes. Such we so greatly cool. appreciate what you do. I'm just being grateful <laughs> to people that you know what, are helpful. They, they offer him his own podcast, and now he's using ours to suck <laughs> up to get the hosting spot. Uh, Terrible. It's grateful. Yeah, um, maybe that is a good way to end. Though we, maybe we should highlight all the wonderful technicians and people who are not given the credit they often deserve because they're the ones who really help us and do our stuff because I, I don't know what I'm we're, we're, we're running around like mad professors with you know sticky out hair and you know it's like tatty lab coat on panicking and making a mess of things and they're the ones keeping the, the ship running for yourself john i'm very yeah. well organized <laughs> I mean, I, I, I am too, but I, I, I have seen people work in that kind of chaotic manner. Yeah, I'm really not. Starts. Make it up on a daily basis at the moment. Okay, any, anything else we can end with? A Merry Christmas to everyone, and hope everyone... This is going to be released quite close to Christmas. Shouldn't we wish everyone Merry Christmas? Ah, well, we'll be leaving work in two days, and then it's only a week till Christmas. Oh, yeah, we will, uh, yeah. Well, of course, uh, December went fast. <laughs> <laughs> Last time uh, I looked, it was late November. Oh. Yeah, don't don't not turn up for work in three days after listening to this if it's not December. So yeah, so, well, so there we go. Shall we shall we round us off there then? And just uh, say say Merry Christmas to all of our, our listeners. Thank you for supporting yeah, us thank- this far in the year, and we uh, we look forward to having you back with us in the in the new year. I guess. Yeah, give us ideas on who we can ask or t- topics that anyone wants to have us get on, because that could be quite helpful. Yeah, you can, you can get in touch through Twitter or uh, you can send an email at preprintsinmotion at gmail.com. Uh, so, yeah, if you've got any suggestions, do get in touch. There we go. We can end on that then. There you go. Well, would, you, would you like to say Merry Christmas, Johnny? No, you didn't say Merry Christmas. I didn't feel I needed to. I feel it was said. Okay. I didn't feel oh, I needed to. Oh, over there. <laughs> I ain't bringing the Christmas joy in. <laughs> they'd rather die than better do it and decrease the surplus population. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Okay, and that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsandmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week. John, what have you found? Oh, are we? Maybe start first? with the one that's from this year, though. I'll start with the one that's from this year. Okay, uh, this is the non-festive one. Uh, so, yeah, bear in mind, obviously, I'll cut this bit out, but bear in mind, yeah, I've only glanced at these, so it's going to take me... No, no, like, no, 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 you'll be leaving death. my thing in where I talk about not having read them. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I, oh no, 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 no I'm, I go first. Yeah. I'm, I'm prepared to, I'm prepared to admit that I've not read it, but I, I'm. Somebody uh, should. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm just going to eat a mince pie. Shut up. Okay. Good plan. <laughs> Behind the scenes, folks. Well, you'll cut this out, won't you? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all blooper reel. <laughs> oh yeah. Um. You know, whilst we're cutting stuff out, we should maybe do a little blooper reel as well. Real as well. Mm. At the end of the episode. For all the fun. Well, shit it's like hard have. to do when you're like. Um, well, maybe at the end of this one, actually, yeah. Yeah, this yeah, one can't be brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just for this one. Yeah. 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 Anyway, sorry. Go, John, go. Oh, I'm going. Me. I'm going. Okay. Give me two seconds to skim the abstract again, just so I get the idea. It's, get... it's, stress, it's stress granules and double-stranded RNA and oh, immunity. It's, you're going to love it. I'm just going to do some <laughs> SMR of me first. eating a mince pie for the listeners instead, then. So like that. <laughs> I can talk about smart soil if you want. Yeah, d- yeah. D- Emma, go first. Give me, give me time <laughs> to do what I should have done early today, but I was being sad about my data. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. you, can, you can get in touch through Twitter or uh, the, the email is on the uh, on the website. Do you um, not know our email? It's, it's, it's you pre-prints don't know our email, John, do you? Gmail. <laughs> it's preprints in motion <laughs> at gmail.com. Yes, it is, but you didn't know. Is that, that right? <laughs> I did. Yes. That was going. That was going so well until you couldn't remember our own email address. Okay. Okay. You can let, edit let, it. Let, 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 let me do. Let me do a run up so that we can. Uh, then I could be like, okay, that's what was. <laughs> or you can send an email at preprintsinmotion at gmail uh, So yeah, if you've got any suggestions, do get in touch. Well done. Seamless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I find out about the different bioarchived licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that Bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows. Mm-hmm.